Chris, thank you so much for coming on Fraud Busting and taking a little bit of your time. Really, truly, I am honored because I didn't know if you would even call me back at all. And so let me just tell the listeners a little bit about your awesomeness. So <laughs> uh, if you've watched McMillions, which you can get on, I think, Hulu and Amazon and Netflix, that is HBO. a, a and where? HBO. Gotta pl- I got to plug oh, HBO. Oh, HBO, yeah. right, HBO. Um, Chris is prominently featured as an investigator who helped bust the uh, cheating and almost, I, I would call it a mafia takeover of the McDonald's Monopoly game. So he really knows his stuff. And now you're at Mace Rich. Um, head of security in Mace Rich is... Uh, y- y'all do malls. You own and operate malls. And I want to talk about that a little bit as we get going, because we have a little bit in common there. And um, he has some other really cool stuff on his resume, like um, in uh, being involved in the um, Branch Davidians situation in Waco, which I was l- uh, lucky or unlucky enough to kind of bump into that um, back when I was in college. So Chris, welcome. <laughs> Thanks, Tracy. Glad to be here. It's yeah, been, yeah. Uh, wonderful, and it looks like uh, we'll have a, an interesting, uh, interesting talk today. I hope. Oh, I'm already fascinated by what we're going to talk about because I talked to Chris. I was like, Chris, let's talk about about McMillions, about the HBO show, and he's like, Let's do better, Trace. He goes, Let's talk all about investigative techniques and um, I and I even want to talk about some of the things that you're doing now at, at the mall, like in in public, because I think a pretty big majority of the country is affected by your decisions today when we go shopping. So um, how do you want to take things, Chris? You want to just jump in? I mean, what's, what's, um, what's your idea on the direction here? Yeah. So let's, let's jump in. We can, you know, at the, at the end, we can talk a little bit about uh, what's going on in in shopping malls and security and shopping malls these days, because uh, it, it may change. It may change in the hour that we, that we talk. It seems to be, be evolving by the minute so it's a moving uh, target yeah yeah and you're right it does affect does affect everybody and you know hopefully hopefully uh, we're, we're pulling out of the out of a, a down period but no what i you know what i thought about uh and, and wanted to to put put forth for your listeners was um so i i just a little bit of background you know i spent most I spent my whole career really with the FBI, and, and a large part of it um, was working and in investigating complex white collar crime cases and some uh, some high level public corruption cases, including an independent counsel case back in the back in the uh, mid '90s that uh, many people have forgotten about. But through that, um, through through those those assignments, I. I, I I, I lost count. I probably did two or three hundred interviews of, and, and we use the term interview. We don't we don't use the term in, in the FBI. We use the term interview. We don't use the term interrogation um, because the interview can be of uh, it could be of a victim, it can be of uh, a witness, and it can be of the subject of the case. And they, there's some some similarities amongst them all that uh, uh, that I've picked up over the years and. What, you know, what I want to talk about today is, is really kind of the mechanics of, of doing a, a thorough, complete, uh, meaningful uh, interview in a white-collar crime or a fraud case. Um, not going not gonna to get into um, your, your field of expertise, which is you know, body deception and the physical things. I'm going to talk more about the you know, the way I the way I did it, and, and and some some tips and some opinions, of course, on on what's worked and what didn't work. Uh, so perfect. That, that, that's going to be the you know that's the agenda for today. Um, you know the the, the I, I think it's useful for not just not just law enforcement officers and fraud investigators, but uh, the the same again tips and mechanics really can apply to anybody who might be um, talking to somebody, even in a corporate setting, about an alleged fraud or, or white-collar crime. It could be somebody in internal audit, it could be somebody in HR, it could be an executive. Um, and, you know, I like to say that when, you know, when the FBI does a white-collar crime interview, the end goal 
is to have something that is sustainable in federal court. And that's a pretty high, that's a pretty high bar. But if, but if you keep that as your goal, no matter, no matter what it is, I mean, it could be a, you know, minor internal employee embezzlement that may only result in a personnel action. But if you keep your, your, your standards at that highest level, you're never going to have, you're never going to have a problem where somebody is questioning the, the, the legitimacy or the thoroughness or the effectiveness of that. Oh, I love that. Oh, yes. Let's jump in. So what's rule number one or, or your, your favorite way to frame up uh, an interview with someone? Because they're, yeah. um, by the time someone meets you, they're in trouble. Yeah, well, and, and maybe. So I'm going to talk, you know, I'm going to, we'll, we'll, we'll start with the idea that, yeah, this is somebody that's in trouble. But remember, and, and, and I've had this happen you're talking to somebody who you're doing an investigation. You're talking to somebody who uh, is a potentially a witness. You think they're a witness, not the main subject. Okay. And you interview them and lo and behold, three months later, somebody says something about them and documents turn up and it turns out that they are a subject too. Mm -hmm. um, so, and, and, you know, same thing with, uh, you know, maybe even a victim. Um, you have to be, you have to be cognizant of where, um, where a victim victim may end up on the stand in a trial. So you've got to, you've got to consider that. So, so no, I, you know, I think the first the, the kind of one of the overall premises of a, and again, I keep using the term white collar fraud interview is it's very tough to get a confession, right? So right. Um, it would be nice and it happens, but by and large, it's, you're, you're dealing with people who are not inclined to let their guard down and, and, and confess. Many of, you know, many of these folks are smarter than, you know, they're, they're, they think they're smarter than everybody else, and okay. sometimes they might be. Um, in many cases, they are also very adept at lying and leading almost double lives sometimes. So, okay. so, so getting somebody like that to um, fall on the sword and confess and admit to um, admit to a fraud and, and having the intent to do it is a pretty high bar. And, you know, we'll talk about um, when that happens or when it's about to happen, but mostly I'm going to focus on the, the things you need to do to, it's, it's almost a chess game, the things you need to do to um, box that person in, in terms of what they, what they say and what they, what they don't say and, and, and things like that. So. Uh, so that's the first kind of major point here or the, the, the ground rules. You know, the second one is, and, and it kind of ties into to that a little bit, is in, in almost every fraud case, you have to prove or show some guilty knowledge, some intent. Mm -hmm. um, and again, that's, you know, that's a high bar. Um, it's happened where people say, yeah, I intended to defraud, but those are rare. Uh, usually there's, there's excuses and, and, and other other factors, and so you end up having to again to build a case around what they give you, and and effectively box them in. So Got it. that's kind of you know that's kind of how I approach uh, broadly uh, these interviews, and that's what we'll that's what we'll talk about today. So um, talk about let's talk about and, I, and I've kind of broken it down into a couple of different stages. So uh, the first is obviously preparation. Um, we'll get into that. We'll get into uh, the, the actual interview, um, the, what I call you know, setting the stage, and then the follow-up on uh, to that. So if you, any questions you want to? I am ready. I, I'm sure I'll have plenty when you get into it, but <laughs> I, I, I'm just, I feel like I'm uh, chomping at the bit. <laughs> yeah, well. It may not, it may not be as exciting as, uh, <laughs> as as some of these other topics, but uh, you know it's, it, I think it's worthwhile. So so let's let's talk about preparation. And the, the, I have really three words for that, and that is study, study, study. Everything you possibly can about the facts that, as you know them, however incomplete, of the matter that you are getting ready to do an interview. You have to 
you have to commit those, those facts to memory and be able to recite them and know what they are and think quickly on your feet as they come up in the interview. Okay. All too often, I see people, they, they kind of go in almost like a fishing expedition and they're, they're, they're looking for some sort of almost charity from the person to, to help them understand. Well, the, the person, the subject, they're going to they're gonna help you understand, but they're not going to know they're doing it. You need to study, 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 and commit to memory and practice, practice the facts, take notes, um, test yourself. So that, that is, and, and again, I see it all the time. Um, it's kind of a, I call it a, you know, ready, ready, fire, aim approach. And that will backfire almost all the time. Sometimes you get lucky, but but it's it's not worth taking the risk. So 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 in in some of these cases that I know you've worked on that have been months and maybe uh, years long. I mean, what what was your like? How long would it take once you got someone actually in with you to to prep? So when you say get somebody in, the prep is before the prep is really before you even call them or or get them to come in and sit down or go to their office and sit down. So. So let's say, for example, um, I've, I've, I've made a phone call and I've, somebody has agreed to meet me to talk about a bank fraud, but they, you know, they can't do it until, until they, they might want to do it right away. They might say, yeah, come over now. And then I don't have time. I, I should have done my preparation and my memorization before. Okay. Um, maybe they say a couple days and then I can, you know, then I can uh, fine tune it, but, but before before I go in, uh, I, and, and, and as an investigator, and there's whole parts of lots of parts of the cases, you really should have a, a, a firm firm knowledge of all the facts, uh, even before you sit down with somebody. Got it. Okay. Okay. Next step. What do you do? Next step. You got to know the elements of the crime that you're trying to prove or or show, um, and and whether it's whether it's the violation of some company rule or all the way up the chain to federal mail fraud, if you haven't looked at and know that there are elements that have to be covered in that interview, you, you're, you're, you're doing half a job. You're, you're a C minus student at that point. So for example, mail fraud, typical, typical federal crime. Um, sounds easy, right? Uh, you know, they, 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 filled out these forms and they, they knew they were false and, and they got money. Well, somewhere in there, you've got to show that they put these forms in the mail, use the U.S. mail. So mm -hmm. um, again, the, in, in the course of the interview, there might be a question in there that says, oh, you know, so you did, and you mailed them. And then how did, how did you mail them again? So, um, you know, and it doesn't always have to be the U.S. mails. It can be it can be Federal Express, um, but that's just that's just an example. So um, again, first thing is study, study, study. Commit everything to memory. Uh, be able to think fast on your feet. Um, next one is know the elements of the crime or the rule or the the policy that that you're trying to um, investigate or are investigating. And then really the third one, and and this this sort of gets into um, more leads into the, the, the sit down and preparation mm -hmm. is um, and I'm a big fan of timelines. Mm -hmm. Absolutely critical to understand the, the timing of things that happen. Inevitably in an interview, somebody may say, well, I, you know, I did this. I, I signed that form on a certain day and it may turn out that that the form wasn't even delivered to them for until a month later okay and the, the, the way to you know for me anyway I have to kind of visualize that I have to see it on a timeline so I'll always try to prepare and I may, may not bring it into the interview with me I might or, but but have a timeline and, and again have it memorized now Somebody says something like that, and I'll, I'll get into this a little more later, but somebody says something that doesn't make sense on the timeline, but they're telling a story. I've, you know, 
I've, I've, I've got them to be talking, which is sometimes a big challenge. We, you know, we got some, some thoughts on that later too, but, but I've got them to be talking and they say something that is inconsistent with my timeline. And do I stop them and challenge them there? No. My opinion is, and this is how I, I did it. Okay. I would, I, I, and, you know, we get in, I'll get into taking notes and stuff, but I would, I would star that, that statement. I put a little asterisk over in the column mm-hmm. of, of my notes. And that tells me at some point I'm going to come back to that. Um, when the time is right, I want to, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to challenge somebody and, and maybe they're mistaken. Maybe it's a mistake and I'm, I'm calling them a liar, uh, unnecessarily. And I've, I've submarined what, what, uh, an okay moving along interview. So, mm-hmm. right. Cause um, let's, let, let's talk about that a little bit because, you know, I help people find out who's lying to them. And the minute you say you're a liar, <laughs> you do, just like you say, you tank the interview. So, oh, yeah. um, so, so you're just starring it, coming back to it later, knowing more than what's, what they think, you know, um, cause they think they, they, if they're lying, they think they've got me. They think oh, I, 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 I breeze through that. And, you know, later on when it, when it, things heat up a little bit, first of all, they think I, you know, I didn't get it or maybe later on they think I forgot about it, but mm-hmm. I've got that asterisk and I know that I've got to go back and recover right. that. Usually they're. You know, you see them, you see them with a little bit of a look on their face, like, whoops. So, uh, yeah. So timelines, um, again, still in the preparation phase. Um, you know, outlines are helpful. Uh, although uh, I've seen, you know, I've seen people walk into an interview with an outline of questions and they just sit there and read them off. And if, that's how it's going to be. You might as well just send the person an email with your outline and ask them to fill it out. It'd be a lot easier for everybody. So, oh, again, yeah. I think I think the outline, the outline, and the timelines go into your your cramming for that exam, that studying that you're going to need to have at the you know at the at the, the top of your mind and at the tip of your tongue when when the time comes. So you know, just like just like a just like a, a college exam where you you, have, you go in there without the book, you better know. You better know your subject. So. Got it. Well, I always tell people that whether it's in, because every now and then I'll get an interrogation question, but I work with a lot of salespeople that have questions uh, for their clients as well. And I always say, you know, if you just go down the list, you're not, you're not, um, you're missing all the information that, that, that you really could extract there. Like you got to stop and go down their path if, if you need to for a little bit until you can come back to yours. Yeah. Yeah. And well, you know, when I, when I talk about the actual, you know, the actual interview process and I, you know, again, three words, be, three words before we study, study, study. When you're in that role and you're, you're going through the questions, it's listen, listen, listen. There's always, there's always time to go back and, and re-ask a question or, or clarify stuff. You've got to, you got to be prepared. You've got to be patient to listen. And sometimes you might be listening to stuff that has nothing to do with the question you've asked. And again, I've seen it a lot of times investigators get impatient. I, I don't want to hear about, you know, I don't want to hear about your trip to Oregon. Uh, that doesn't have anything, you know, that's, that's not what we're here to talk about. It might, and it, and, and it might give you background on, you know, more information to fill in your timeline. So um, again, patience and listening. So um, this day, in this day and age, it's it's a lot easier still still talking about preparation before we mm-hmm. before we sit down with somebody this day and age it's a lot easier to get a feel or a handle on the personality than it was 15 20 years ago and why mm-hmm. do i say that well pretty easy now to get on facebook mm-hmm. or linkedin or any kind of social media and get a flavor of what this person is writing about themselves um Somebody who has no social media presence uh, probably tells you they're they're private and they're they're not going to be as as wordy or verbose as somebody who has got their own website or somebody who's talked about all the wonderful things they've done or or, or somebody who's all over Facebook with with the posts on everything under the sun. That that's again works to your benefit. You know, going in, okay, I'm going into somebody who 
is going to talk, 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 or you know, I've got I've got somebody who is is you know, ranted about the government or right, or right, brother, and I I know what I'm getting into. So again, if, if you're if you're an investigator and you have those those uh, sources at your you know at your at your tips or your fingertips and it's available and you don't take advantage of it again you're as i say a c you know you're a c minus student so uh, got it okay so so you've prepped you know the story you know your subject what comes next yeah so now now we're setting the stage and you know this is the and this varies you know it varies from from case to case from person to person um some people may you know it really it just depends and and I, I, that's really all I can say in terms of, okay, do we invite them into the office? Do we go to their office? Do we go to their house? Uh, it's kind of all over the ballpark. And it really, again, it depends a lot on the case and the person. So, um, but, but there's, there's a few things and, and, you know, I get, you get a question here and there. Um, should I bring, should I have, or should I bring all my files? Mm -hmm. to have handy well if you do you, you better damn sure have them very well organized and know and be able to at a moment's notice flip to a page using you know a tab or something like that because um, again a lot of this is a it's, it's a bit of a power play mm -hmm. and you know if you're talking to a subject or a, you know a fraudster you want them to believe and this is, you know, so obvious and common sense. You want them to believe that you know more about them than they know, more about the crime than they know, and that you're impeccably organized. And you start fumbling around with a folder, and you can't find what you were looking for. Um, you're better off just leaving it at home. So, uh, if you're going to bring them, and you might need to. I mean, there may be, you know, there may be very, you know, very important times, elements of a crime where. You know, somebody says, well, I signed. Yeah, I did. I remember I signed that form. Okay, that's great. You probably, you probably need to show them the form mm -hmm. and, and, and lock them into their signature. Um, so they've already said they signed it. And, you know, now that can backfire because now you might be giving them an out and they say, huh, well, that's not my signature. Well, you just said you signed it. So. Oh, wow. Now, do you ever do the tactic where you have a stack of folders, you put your hand on it as you ask a question, knowing yeah. that you don't have the answer, but making them think that the answer is in that set of files? You ever done that? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, that's, you know, that's, that's some of the trickery that goes into it. Um, I used to work a lot of telemarketing cases, boiler, these boiler rooms where they would, I mean, and these guys were, I mean, these guys were, what's the word, you know, I, I I'd use a profanity. I mean, they were pieces of crap. Yeah, because um, scum of the earth. Scum of the earth, pieces mm -hmm. of crap. Because they preyed, they preyed on lonely, desperate old people, and would literally terrorize them over the phone to, to send in more money. And you know, oh. you're a lo you're a loser. You you're so close to winning this con this contest, and you're in the final round. And you, what do you mean you, you can't pay the taxes? You, you know. So so we would we we might get a tape or two. Uh, of of that somebody's somebody's kid may have come into the house and was able to tape record one of these phone calls or or they were the result of some you know undercover or something we were doing mm -hmm. well bring these people in and i may i may have one tape well <laughs> that's not too impressive what is impressive is a wall full of you know a hundred tapes that all say the same thing uh-huh <laughs> And I may say, I've got you, I've got you recorded for the last year. Oh boy. Look at all these tapes. Every one of these is you. Yeah, I don't pick one. You pick one and we'll play it. And of course, no matter which one they pick, it's gonna be the it's gonna be the, the same one tape. tape I, it's the one tape I have. Uh -huh. So um you know, sometimes sometimes they they'll pick up on that. But anyway, that's so yeah, to answer your question, yeah, you would you know, you, you stage stuff up, but Again, know your know your your interviewee. Um, be confident it's not going to backfire and have egg on your face. So. Got it. Got it. Okay, what's next? So where are we at? Okay, so went to the interview process, and you know this this is getting into a little bit of the mechanics. But we, we've you know we're sitting down with somebody, and we're 
we're starting to talk, uh, I said, you know, you, you, there's some questions you can ask and you, you want to you get them talking. Listen, listen, listen. But mechanically, and this, this is, again, I think really critical. Um, different people have different techniques. I mean, some people record interviews. I'm not a big fan of that. Um, it kind of depends on the circumstances. Um, sometimes you need to, but in often in white collar crime cases, there's there, there's enough other um, information and, and and the 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 ultimate report and the description sometimes is, is too complicated to just have a transcript of a recording, which is going to have to be transcribed anyway. So yeah. we'll, we we get back to that, but so. I, I said, you have got to learn to take almost shorthand notes and, and know what they mean to you. So I'm asking a question, I'm making eye contact, I'm listening. I might periodically glance down to jot down a, a, a word or a symbol or a couple mm -hmm. of words um, that I know I can go back and understand what they are. So, you know, abbreviations, I use K for contract, big K. Uh, sometimes I'll, you know, use an arrow to, to, to link one thought to the next, mm -hmm. um, you know, therefore the, the three dots that form yep. a triangle. Yeah, I use things that like, one. Yeah. So, you know, yeah. So things like that, because the idea is you want to, you want to keep the flow going, but get, get sufficient information. There'll be time later that afternoon or the next day to sit down and go through that, go through your notes and, and, and write it up. So, um, that's a you know it's a tough skill to master um you know i've seen people start they start you know, writing down verbatim what the person said and, and that's almost almost never a good thing now there are times where if somebody makes a statement that you need to capture that statement they said something that i want to have that in quotes of course write that down put it in quotes mm -hmm. so you know later on when you're writing it up um you know trait you know uh, you know miss miss brown stated the following quote pop uh, pop end quote and then you know you have it you have it got um, it got it okay okay i mentioned you know i mentioned i use you know the two columns um you know i have my column column on the right side for notes and then uh you know what what the person's saying and then on the left side might be my asterisks or 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 a note to myself you know doesn't make sense check timeline things mm -hmm. like that, that i that i'll go back to um so um I, I talked about this the importance of, of not really interrupting um it's it's people tend to do that they get impatient um if, if you've got somebody talking i'd say you know, just let them go let them talk listen as close as you can write it down again don't get glued to an outline um now here's here's kind of a separate sort of a a an important uh, sort of subset technique in a in a in a white collar or a fraud interview, and mm -hmm. I call this: you need to elicit subjective responses. So, what does that mean? Right. I may ask a question: Was the loan approved? And the answer is yes or no. Yes, yes. or no. Yeah. When was it approved? Uh, March, March of 2020, something like that. Okay, that's that's all well and good, but I, I may have somebody who's not, you know, who's not talking a lot, and even if they are, I always ask a question to elicit a subjective response about that question. And one of the ones, and a, and a prosecutor I work with um, taught me this, and I saw him do it a lot, and it it, it really was almost magical. Somebody would say something like that. Um, and, and it may not even be, you know, something as clear as was the loan approved, but, mm -hmm. uh, or, or something like, you know, well, well, he, he wouldn't meet with us or something, you know, I, he, he seemed to be hesitant to meet with us. And we would always ask, okay, was that a good thing or a bad thing? Oh, that's so, interesting. And, okay. and inevitably they, they it kind of catches people, they, they've got to think about it. And because it, it can be one or the other, it could be something in the middle. They may say neither. They, you know, it, it's amazing what the responses are because then you start to see, and that that starts to go to the 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 building up the 
uh, I call it, you know, the castle of guilty knowledge or intent. Okay. Um, so they say, well, you know, it was, it was a good thing. Uh, the loan was a prevail. That was a good thing. Why? Well, you know, because we got, we, we got the money to build the, uh, the project and, mm -hmm. and what did that lead to? So again, I, I think you know, don't, don't, don't get stuck on, on factual objective either or kind of questions. You've got to ask them, but always try to follow with what, a, what, what can I, what can I get in a subjective or an emotional um, response from, from the person? Oh, I love that. Oh, that is gold right there. I, no wonder it works so well. I can, I can see it working great. I know I'm kind of, kind of flying along here, but I guess oh, it's all. Yeah, all we're good. doing good. We're doing great. Okay, good. Um, so next, you know, next topic in, um, you know, in, the, in this realm is, and I, I call it, in, in anybody who's done these interviews, you'll, you'll get people who, when, when, when the questions get tough and the questions start getting close to what they maybe don't want to talk about, yeah. all of a sudden they, they have trouble remembering or, or you know, they're vague yep. and, and they don't know. And, and, okay, maybe it's true. Maybe they legitimately don't remember or they, their memory is bad. But, you know, and this, this is kind of a, a, a courtroom trick or a courtroom technique, but, but it really – it really applies more in, you know, in, in an interview or even a polygraph per se is you need to assess the person's memory and ability to recall details in something that is non-threatening. Right? Yeah. So yeah. Get their baseline. Absolutely. You, you develop that baseline and it, it and, and I'd say you plan that in advance. Mm -hmm. So for example, it might be, um, hey, so you, you know, you, you started this job a couple of years ago. Um, tell me about your first day on the job. That sounds, you know, that sounds interesting. And they'll get, they'll get into all kinds. Oh yeah. And then, you know, and then, and then Tommy took me to lunch and, you know, we had, uh, ate at, uh, Cheesecake Factory. And well, what'd you, what'd you eat at? Wow. Cheesecake Factory. I like that. What did you eat? Yeah. Oh, they're, you know, their, their steak fries are really good. Yeah. 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 And so they'll remember on things like that. You, They'll, they'll remember all kinds of details. You start getting it, and you're getting into the uncomfortable things, and, and now they can't remember. So you know, okay, you know, I, I know that I'm in an area that this person probably knows more, and they're just, you know, they're they're just not willing to tell. Me. But oh again, yeah, well that that happens too in uh, in depositions, and you may have watched the um, the Theranos Elizabeth Holmes. Oh, yeah. Case. yeah, she said, I don't know, 608 times in her deposition of six hours. <laughs> so yeah. she didn't know a damn thing when she got in there, but she had it all figured out before then. So, um, yeah. yeah. I, did, I did see that. That's, uh, <laughs> it's just funny how, how they, and, you know, and, and I think there's, and again, I'm not a lawyer, but there's a reason for, for them to ask 600 questions and lock her down mm -hmm. into you know, into an answer so that later on when there's a, a, a trial or something it kind of makes it hard to answer the same question in a way that yeah. benefits you when you said I don't know two months ago and, mm -hmm. and now you know so um, yeah and, and, it, and it's the same thing with interviews um, you know you, you, you put down you don't know and I, I may ask you know, hey why you know you, you, I don't, I don't want to get, again, I'm not, I'm not, I may start to get a little confrontational. Uh -huh. um, it really kind of depends, but I might point that out that, you know, boy, I'm, you seem to remember some things really well. And, and this thing, which is really important to you. Yeah. <laughs> no clue. Yeah. yeah. You, this is, this is, this is pretty important. This is why we're here. And, and this affects your situation. And you, you're, you're having a lot of trouble remembering it. And, you know, why is that? And see what they, see what wow. They okay. Okay. What's next? Oh, this is good. I love this. <laughs> um, yeah. So, um, again, kind of a common sense thing. People often, you know, they forget to follow up and, and ask the question. So somebody says, somebody may say, um, you know, well, you know, when I wrote, I, I wrote him a note. And, you know, when I, 
you know, whatever. I mean, it's not a good example. I, you know, I, um, I took a phone call from him and he said, okay, that's great. And, and time, date, what they say, you know, oh, was the phone call a good thing or a bad thing? Blah, blah, blah. Hey, where is that? Do you have phone records? Where is that documented? Do you, okay. you know, do you get a phone bill? Is there, you know, is, is there something on your, on your phone log that shows that and, and get it? A lot of there's so much of everything we do now is captured and documented. Somewhere. Oh yeah. And um, again, very important to, to follow up and get and ask the question and get as much of that as you can. If it doesn't, if they, they may say, no, it's destroyed. I, we shred all our stuff. Okay. I write that down. That means later on, they can't walk into court and say, oh, look, here's, Here's the here's the, the the phone records and it shows something else. Uh, you said you shredded them. So, uh, nail down the documentation. Got it. Okay. All right. Um, so I'm kind of no no particular order. So mostly I'm talking about somebody who is a a subject or a suspect in a, in a case, and, and and somebody maybe even people who are witnesses who were involved that. That may may or may not may or may not be involved, um, but let me talk a little bit about victims okay. and the importance of of kind of kind of knowing your victim. And and I think sometimes, especially where you have victims that are victims are generally somewhat sympathetic. Um, there there's often a uh, uh, sympathy factor going on with the investigator and the, and the victim and, and, and it should be, uh, but, and, and it's important to understand that your victim at some point may be testifying in a, in a trial or a deposition against somebody who is not going to be friendly to them. Sure. And so really kind of two things. And, and, and that is, as politely as you can, if you know, test that victim's ability to withstand a little little bit of uncomfortable questions. Uh, it's better to know it before they get in front of a you know grand jury or even a jury and, and fall apart. If they have if they've got problems. If they've got you know, they've done things wrong, kind of best you can get a handle on it. One of the cases that. Um, I'm familiar with, and, and I know you guys have done, you've done a lot of like Ponzi scheme, investment scheme stuff. A little bit. Um, yeah. Yeah. I talked to um, a good friend of mine got sucked into one of those. What do you yeah. know? Yeah. And, and, and so one of the things that has to be, you know, you got to consider an investment case is um, let, me, let me try to explain this, right? If somebody, somebody's a victim and they are, let's say somewhat sophisticated investor and they've got accounts at Charles Schwab and Fidelity and all kinds of other, you know, accounts. And every, every month they get a, a big long statement that has all kinds of disclosures and it's professional and they can go on a website and they can see their, their earnings. And, and you know, they have somebody, there's an 800 number to call. And then they get involved in a in a Ponzi scheme or an investment scheme that's hey it's overseas and and they end up getting uh, a one page uh, spreadsheet printout from the from the from this quote unquote financial advisor. Okay. The that I mean that looks a little um, the, the que that person is going to get questioned on the stand. Wait a minute don't you see any difference here? And now it doesn't excuse the fraud, uh -huh. but it, it, it can, it can dirty up the case. And, and, you know, didn't it seem odd to you that you got this one page uh, paper and, and you continue to invest money. And yet that same month you got four statements from Fidelity and Charles Schwab that, that were 15 pages long. Mm -hmm. you, you, you should have, you should have known better. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and and some of the you know some of the the good fraud investigators, especially in investment cases, I you know I, I worked with and, and did. 
they would always ask their victims, what other, what other investments and in, do you have? Oh, okay. Can you bring those, bring those statements in as mm-hmm. well? And again, just, it, it's almost fair to them. You, you want to put, you want to protect them from, um, you know, from walking up, getting on the stand, thinking that this is all going to be a walk in the park. And then they, they get butchered. By, well, by yeah, it's, it's tough up there. I've been on the witness stand once in a, um, in a case I had a, a tenant who um, had an altercation with another tenant and, the, and I'd never been on the stand before. It was even before I was, um, I was in this line of work and it is tough up there. They do their best to make you look like a fool. There's no doubt about that. Oh yeah. Yeah. Oh, I've, <laughs> I've spent a lot of time and, 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 and it's, it's funny because if, if you're not funny, but if you're an investigator, you can, and, and you're getting questioned, you can almost see it coming. Like you see them start going down a road uh-huh. of questioning and you're like, oh boy, I know where this is going. Uh-huh. And you know, the best bet is, is hey, let's, let's answer, let's, let's answer this question and move on. I, just an example. I can, you know, I can tell stories all day. Um, I, I had a case once, and again, it was a telemarketing case and I was on the stand for days and we had, we had in, uh, some cooperating persons or informants working within the this boiler room uh, we had instructed them never 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 do any sales you can't get on the phone you can't participate in the criminal conduct you can't get on the phone and defraud people you can work there you can be an admin person you can take care of the books all that but that's it so we end up going to trial and there's there's these massive sales logs that are the old dot matrix printouts that are oh yeah four inches thick, and the the defense attorney he's he's asking he's asking me about the cooperator you know let's let's you know let's call her, let's call her Marge. So so you're saying you you instructed Marge to not sell right yes, and you're saying that she didn't sell yes. Are you, you know, would it surprise you if she said, yeah, and I, I could see it and I, and it dawned on me that somewhere in that 800 page dot matrix printout, they had found a sale or two that she had done. Mm. And now it didn't, it didn't tank the case, but it was, you know, I, I could see it coming and I, 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 you know, and then as soon as I asked, I was like, you know, I can, to the best of my knowledge, but I can't say, you know, I can't say that it, that it never happened. And I can't say, and I almost screwed up. I almost, you know, I almost said, I can't say that sales register is accurate because we were relying on that oh. for, <laughs> for the total loss on the case. So uh-huh. that would have, you know, again, that comes down to, you know, being able to, you know, think, think, think ahead and think on your feet. But uh, anyway, yeah. So again, that's, that's the whole, you know, testimony, you know, you don't want to put your, you don't want to put your, 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 your victims and your witnesses in a, in a position that they're, that they're not prepared. For. Got it. Got it. So, so we're done with the interview. Now what? We, yeah. What happened? We got, we got, we got pages and pages of notes and we've got some good information and, and, you know, we've got, you know, we've got some other stuff. Well, let me, hey, before we get in that, let's, let's talk a little bit about confession because sometimes every so often it'll happen, you know, in a fraud case, you know, it, and I'm sure, you know, have it happen too and it's usually it's, there's usually a build to my experience there's a build-up to it right you can you can see it starting to to, to to come out but it's never it never is like out of the blue yes i i in fact intended to defraud 18 usc 1001 and yeah yeah it, it's it's this you know little by little uh, coming about and and you know and, and i found a lot of times they, they sometimes they need a little push to get to get to that point and um you know one of the you know there's there's a lot of ways to do it i i would a couple things i would say would be hey look you know first of all let's you know you're you're you're, you're too close to this you're too close to the billboard to read what it says let's take a step back and look at this this whole picture you know you're you're fixating on a little fact here a little fact there something you didn't do uh-huh. but if you step back you see the whole picture and it tells a story. You see the billboard. You can't read the billboard when you're three inches away from it. So right. I step back and look at it the way the way a jury, a prosecutor, defense attorney is going to look at it. So that, that's one way. And then, you know, in a fraud case, usually 
you know, usually nobody's wounded or dead. Um, and sometimes that carries some weight with people. You say, look, this is, hey, this is only money. It's only things that can be replaced. Nobody's dead. Nobody's bleeding. Um, you know, this, you'll get through this. This is fixable. Right. And, and sometimes that's, that's really all they, you know, that's all they need to, to again, put it in perspective because they, they're thinking, well, their life has ended and they're going to, or, or they're going to fight this to the, you know, the bitter end. And, right. And, you know, you know, we all know the, the, the trick of, hey, get this off your chest, you'll feel better. And it's not, I don't know, sometimes people, that, that seems sometimes like cliche-ish. Sometimes people don't, don't buy into that. Um, get to that point, usually uh, in a white collar case, uh, I'm going to ask, we get to um, the, the point where, yeah, you know, I'm the one who, who did X, Y, and Z, and I knew it was wrong. I'm usually going to ask, let's, let's try to get this in, you know, why, don't, why don't you write this out? Let's, let's try to get a written statement of how you feel about this today and what you did, because you know, this is the time to, to, to move on. This is the, uh, an important part, a crossroad in your life. You're making the right decision, but let's, you know, but let's, let's memorialize it. Sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. Right, right. That's, that's how we would do it. All right, so let's go back. Um, we're talking about you come back to the office or um, wherever it is, you're going back to your office, and now you've got pages of, pages of cryptic notes and abbreviations and, and all kinds of stuff. Um, what do you do? That doesn't mean anything to anybody except you, so it's time to, it's time to write it up. Um, I would always, when I, this is how I would do it. If I used, if I used a blue pen in the interview, I would get a, a red pen or a different color pen and go through my notes on my notes right after and clarify or, or, or spell out things that I, okay. I might have missed while my memory's fresh. So yeah, yeah. The, 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 then the question is, you took notes during the interview, didn't you? Yes, I did. Those are the blue notes. The, the blue ink, as you see, is the ones I took during the interview. The red notes are addendums and other things that I wrote down immediately after that interview, you know, two hours later when I got back to the office. So there's no question about, you know, about memory, about, about did I add stuff. Um, it's always been, it's always, because a lot of times in trials, at least in federal trials, defense attorneys will get the notes. They'll get your notes. So you better have them. Um, and you better be able to explain them because they'll pick them apart. Um, and, and your notes. So ultimately you're going to do a write up, a report. Um, and you know, that's a whole nother, that's like a grammar lesson, and uh, a pretty boring topic, but yeah, uh, you know, the, the writing format. Uh, and I, you know, I, I used to really drive, drive my agents crazy with, with writing. And make sure you write in the passive, not, you know, or write in the active, don't write in the passive, uh -huh. you don't write in the present tense, and, you know, don't use so many commas, and acronyms are helpful, but not too many, and on and on and on, so that, that's a whole nother topic, but, um, so, so, you know, in different, you know, different organizations have different rules, but uh, I, I think, you know, for the most part, an, an interview gets, gets written up into some report in some way, shape, or form, and, and the the more, you know, the more professional that can be. And, and it has to tie into the notes. I mean, if, if, you know, if there's, if there's a whole paragraph of stuff in there, that's not in the notes, you better be prepared to, better be prepared to explain it. Someone uh -huh. it may come up. And that's okay. I mean, it happens, you know, I, Hey, I just, he said that it's stuck in my mind. I didn't have time to write it down, but I, I remember it. Um, so here's, here's another thing, and I, I kind of jumped over this. this. This goes back to sort of the setup and the prep. And that is, so if, if, we're, if we're doing an interview and we're writing, I'm writing it up the way I described. I, it's, it's you and I, I'm taking a bunch of these notes, and then I'm, you know, and then I'm typing them up or I'm having, I'm having them type written, and then that, that report gets submitted to my, my HR department or mm -hmm. my, my head of internal audit or to the prosecutor or something. Ultimate, it's still your word against mine. Right, right. So you can say all you, you know, I can say, I can say, no, 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 here's my notes. I, he said it. And it comes down to a question of credibility. Right. Who, who's telling the truth, who's not. We, we would always, you always try to have, I always recommend, you have a second person there. 
just to, you know, they, they don't have yeah. to, they don't, they don't have to be really involved. They should know what's going on, but, but th that's your, that's your witness, uh, so to speak. And again, it, it, you know, it just helps. Them. So wow, that is, that is, that, a is lot. My, that is my 50 or 48 minute lesson on fraud and white collar. <laughs> interview uh interview tips and tricks and mechanics that is a master class and um I, i've learned some of this because i've i've taken some um you know interrogation classes with fbi and police and and things and uh, you know you never learn it, everything in there and so um yeah. you're, you're the man well, again, you're again awesome. you know white collar white collar stuff's a little different you know it's more complicated mm -hmm. uh, you know the people are the people are much less willing to to confess. I mean, I've done done you've done interviews with you know with, with murderers, with with pedophiles, with and and you, you for some reason you know they're they're, they're more likely to get a an easy a confession or, or, or facts out of them than than dancing around for hours with with a you know uh, somebody in, you know somebody in corporate finance who's embezzled you know five hundred thousand dollars because you know they uh, there's in their mind there's a lot more at stake and 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 there's they, they feel like they're smarter than you and they might even feel like they were entitled to it and it's all it's all confusing so yeah, i think yeah. white collar, i think white collar you know it, it, you, you really start getting into a little more of the you know what you see in in depositions and, and you know trial preparation in, in complicated cases um, you yeah, know as an, invest yeah. as an investigator if you you can develop those skills and have reports that that sail through and, and are meaningful for whoever it is. You you know you've really earned your pay and you know you feel you'll always oh, wow. be busy. Yeah. Oh, this is fantastic stuff. So I just got to take a couple seconds. Sure. And, um, we're gonna change the subject because let, let's talk about the mall. <laughs> <laughs> let's, talk, let's talk about what's going on at the mall and. Because because you're you're head of security for Mace Rich, and I know I I've worked with you all. Um, I think it was before you were there uh, mm -hmm. to put on a festival, and to, even in our uh, our exchanges, I didn't realize how like everybody makes makes fun of mall cops, um, <laughs> and mm -hmm. uh, you know there's movies about it and everything. But uh, tell us what are what are you all doing moving forward at the mall? This based on all this mess that's going on now with the virus. I mean, things are starting to open back up in bits and pieces. Um, what, what's, what's your primary concern these days? And, and what, can, what can we expect at least, at least now when we go to the yeah. mall? Yeah, well, you know, I, I hope you do go to the mall. Um, <laughs> uh, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll see. I think it depends from state to state what's going on. Uh, you know, some, of them are, some of them are already starting to, to get busy. Um, you know, back to your, your point about, you know, mall cops and uh, you're right. They, 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 they get a bad rap. Um, they are, I, I've, I've come to really um, respect and appreciate these, these guys and gals and what they do because there is that stigma. Um, they take a lot of crap sometimes from people. Oh yeah. Unfairly. Um, they're not paid very well. Uh, you know, many of them, have other aspirations, but, but some of them, that's, that's their job. And we, you know, we, as, as, as the public and as, as uh, businesses, we expect them to do everything. We expect them to be the, the jack of all trades. We expect them to run toward a problem. We expect them to respond in active shooter situations, uh, you know, deal with, deal with fires, deal with sicknesses. Um, we've had, you know, I've had, numerous uh, instances where our, our security staff has had to uh, perform CPR and use mm. AEDs on people. Uh -huh. um, they, they deal with, uh, as you know, uh, where up where you are, uh, the homeless and transient population is, yep. is, is a problem. And, and at the same time, we expect them to be good ambassadors and, and, and helpful and assists the the shoppers um, in, in, a, in a pleasant, courteous way. That's mm. a that's a pretty high bar. So I, it really I, is. Yeah, I, I really I've really come to respect them. And 
So now we, you know, now we've added another uh, element to their job, which is we expect you to, you know, we want you to keep working in the mall. You, you're going to be exposed to people. You're going to wear a mask. That's required now and almost everywhere. And that's what we're going to do. Yeah. And um, you have this, this other, this other um, difficult responsibility. And that is, you know, try to, as best you can, um, make people in the mall feel safe, enforce, and, and enforce is a tough word, but monitor and uh, be on top of social distancing. And in some places, there's requirements that people wear masks. And, you know, you've got to, you know, we expect you to, you know, to address that. So it's, it's, it's a challenging time. Um, we are, I mean, the amount of effort and, and planning and, and uh, thoughtful um, discussion and meetings that have gone into preparing um, our properties to reopen is really, from my perspective, pretty impressive. And, and, you know, almost very, you know, very different from, you know, strict investigation and security and mm -hmm. the, things mm -hmm. I, the things I'm used to. Um, so, so what, what can you expect? I, I you know, I think, um, I think, I mean, I, if, you, if you've gone to, there's a lot of stores that are open, some of the big box stores and the grocery stores. I, I think that's, you know, hopefully we can see that level of, of foot traffic and, and, and sales in the, in the traditional malls. Um, you know, uh, uh, people, 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 I think, want to get out still, uh, get out of the so. house. You can only order so much stuff online. Mm -hmm. um, so fingers crossed, fingers crossed. But, but I, you know, I do, I do, I, I can say on behalf of the company that um, there has been a, just the highest priority put on sanitation, safety, and, um, you know, security of our, of our, of our, of our visitors. And I know that sounds, I, I know that sounds like a press release, but um, I've, it's, it's, it's not, it's coming from, it's coming from what I've experienced over the last two months. Oh, wow. Well, I gotta tell you, um, I feel better about going to the mall. I won't make fun of mall cops anymore. Mm -hmm. And, uh, like, like just, I shouldn't say that I did, did that a lot, but, um, like, like I actually feel better, uh, knowing you a little more and knowing your expectations of them and, and more about what their job really is that, you know, we just don't think about when we just want to go in and buy a shirt, you know? So, mm -hmm. um, Chris, thank you so much for, for coming on. Uh, this is, this really has been a masterclass. And, um, I know, I know why those people who game the McDonald's system did not get away with it with you on the other side. I would not want to go up, up against you for any reason, um, in any kind of investigation. <laughs> so, so thank you so well, thank you. much. Yeah, thank you, thank yeah. you. I appreciate it. It was uh, it was fun. I enjoyed it, and you know, any anything I can do to you know, spread some spread some tips and knowledge, I'm I'm happy to do it. Uh, oh yeah, yeah, so. we'll do it. Be careful. I'll have you back. <laughs> Absolutely. Like, yeah, we got we have other topics to talk about. So you know, let me know. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll do it. <laughs>